Mondstadt, the first step in the penultimate hero's journey. It's a mistake to write Mondstadt off as just a starter area. Its rich lore is connected to an ancient, unified civilization that once encompassed all of Tevat, its shadow looming over all that came after it. The Archons themselves speak of the Archon War as if it were ancient history, and to any typical human, even a thousand years is an incomprehensible span of time. But every scattered lore tidbit points us closer to an answer, closer to the big picture of Tevat's history as a whole. What came before those last 2,000-some-odd years may continue to give us clues to Tevat's present, and to the cyclical nature of this fantastical world cycle of life and death. Of most important note, the sacrificial weapons mention three important clans from Mondstadt's history, the Gunhilder clan, the Lawrence clan, and the Eimanlocker clan. I'm Ganymede. And I'm Psyche, and we'll be your guides to the story of the sacrificial weapons, before we go any further, be warned that this is a lore deep dive with a little bit of theory crafting sprinkled in. There will be spoilers up to and including the most recent Sumeru Archon quests in 3.2. The sacrificial weapons all share the trait of having been created as purely ceremonial weapons that gained power as they survived the subsequent ages, eventually becoming powerful weapons to be wielded in actual combat. The Sacrificial Sword On the cliff facing the Eastern Sea, the ancestors worshipped the Masters of Time and Animo together. The two of them are intimately related, as expressed in the saying, Animo brings stories while time nurtures them. The sword tells the story of protection to show the courage to protect. Originally just a prop, its blade was sharpened by the passage of time. This sword once belonged to the kindly Gunhilda clan. In sacrificial ceremonies, they would enact the defense of Mondstadt. There were three acts in the ceremony dedicated to the winds of time. The final act told a tale of the protection of Mondstadt, of life, and of freedom. The ceremony and its history have now been lost, but the Gunhilda clan continues to act as guardians of Mondstadt to this day. The Gunhilder clan is one we're already quite familiar with, namely through Jean and Barbara. Jean is the modern-day carrier of the Gunhilder torch, and she clearly embodies their ideals as a defender of Mondstadt. In the days of the Storm God Decarabian, it was the Gunhilders who lived outside of old Mondstadt in the unforgiving and barren tundra. They built the first temple in the Far East, the Thousand Winds Temple, as it would later come to be known, and there worshipped Venti as the symbol of their rebellion against Decarabian's tyranny. It was Jean's distant ancestor who crowned Venti with laurels upon his ascension to godhood after their hard-won victory. As this weapon is the first we're covering in the series, I want to also talk about the introductory sentences that bring to mind some of the most heavily theorized about facts in the story so far. The ancestors worshipped the masters of Animo and Time together. The two are intimately related as expressed in the saying, Animo brings stories while Time nurtures them. Venti's third character story tells us this. The Lord of Wind, who lived in his high tower, was Decarabian, god of storms. He squinted from on high at his subjects, who bowed before him in the unceasing wind, and, believing them submissive, thought this was good. In those days, Venti was but a single thread of the thousand winds that roared through the northern lands. He who would in latter days be known as Barbados, was but a tiny elemental spirit without a shred of divine dignity, a breeze that brought subtle changes for the better, or tiny seeds of hope. This little block of text only truly began to have significance when Enconomia was released in version 2.4. The update gave us access to a book called Before the Sun and Moon, the contents of which are rumored to have been the reason that the serpent god, Orobashi, whose skeleton you can see spanning Musojin Gorge, had to die. In Before the Sun and Moon, we are introduced to Istaroth, the god of time. She is quite specifically called the Thousand Winds of Time, or just the Thousand Winds. This hint at Venti's origin is quite tantalizing, but it's a tangent that we'll have to cover in another video. I chose to mention this here in particular because unfortunately, the Sacrificial Sword's description doesn't give us much to go on beyond that. The Sacrificial Greatsword 
The intro sentences are the same, and then the description goes on to say, The sword tells a story of war, and was used in the enactment of war tales. Originally just a prop, its blade has been hardened by the passage of time. This sword once belonged to the Imanlaka clan, a clan of brave and gifted warriors who fought hard and died young. In sacrificial ceremonies, they would enact duels between brave warriors stained black with blood. In the eyes of the Imanlaka clan, combat existed not for protection, for glory, or for gaining territory. Rather, it was for the amusement of the gods, high up in the heavens, for whom little else could serve to entertain. Monsters and outlaws, they fought them all the same with no regard for whether this time they would return to their beloved afterwards. For none of that mattered. What mattered was to roar loud and clear in the heat of bloody battle. That was duty fulfilled. Such hot blood running through the veins should not have been conducive to a long history for the Imanlaka clan, for their fight was won without end and without hope of victory. And yet, as the snow slowly melted and Mondstadt began to take shape, gradually they realized they had found something to fight for at last. Early on in the game's life, I remember seeing a lot of people say that the weapon descriptions were likely just stories and would have little bearing on the plot. This has since repeatedly been proven not to be true. Hoyaverse really has a way of storytelling that seems to scream at us. There is no such thing as coincidences. This sword is just one of those many things. It was one in the gacha pool on release, but the clan it mentions, Imanlaka, would come to play a bigger role in the deep lore of Genshin Impact than anyone could have guessed. It leads us back to one place, Dragonspine. The enigmatic mountain towering menacingly over the low, green plains of Mondstadt. The Imanlaka clan name originated there. It was the name of the sole survivor of the catastrophe that Celestia brought down on Salvin Dagnir, which was once as green and verdant as we know Mondstadt to be in the current day. He returned too late to save his people, and decided that the gods of Celestium must delight in bloody battle and slaughter if this was the kind of future they wanted to create. This became the core belief of the clan that would descend from the man called Imanlocker. Many years later in Old Mondstadt, while it was ruled by the tyrannical god of storms, Decarabian, the Imanlocker clan was known for producing powerful warriors who often died young. To cover the full importance of Imanlocker would require another video entirely, as well as a deep dive in Dragonspine's full story, but these are the important parts thus far. This weapon set seems to be full of lead-ins like this to other important stories in the narrative, each one like the seeds brought by the Anemo god to be nurtured by the winds of time into full stories. The Sacrificial Bow Again, the introduction repeats itself, then the story continues. This bow tells the story of the pioneers and the hardships they went through. It used to be a prop with an immobile bowstring, but the string became both flexible and sturdier with the passage of time. This bow was once the property of the proud Lawrence clan. In the far-flung past, they used it to reenact their clan's brave victory over the frozen wilderness. The first act of the ceremony told the tale of their forebearers conquering the land through their wisdom and strength. Over their long history, though this ceremony was lost, they continued to play out the same role. But this role became corrupted. Gradually, their view of themselves shifted from conquerors to overlords to kings. Gradually, they strayed into the path of depravity and lost the affection of Mondstadt's winds. This is one of the more well-known stories mentioned in this set. There isn't much mystery here, as the Genshin Impact webcomic tells us exactly what happened to the Lord's family. They set themselves up as the rulers of Mondstadt, forgetting the folly of the Storm God in the past, and in doing so, brought about their own downfall at the hands of Venti and his champion Vanessa, the first dandelion knight who rose up from gladiatorial slavery to free her people and all of Mondstadt. The stain of the Lawrence family's evil remains to this day, and Eula, despite being a captain in the Knights of Favonius, is often harshly reminded of her family's past. I've noticed a reoccurring theme in Genshin Impact storytelling that the sins of the forefathers weigh heavily on the shoulders of the youth, and the youth rise up to overcome these challenges. This isn't really a lore thing, it's just a storytelling thing that I think is super neat. The Sacrificial Fragments 
This one, though worded differently, has a similar introduction to the others. This change-up makes me feel it fits best chronologically as the final piece of the series, and it reads as follows. In the early days, the people of Mondstadt had a tradition of building theaters on top of windy cliffs to please the gods. Rituals took the form of performances, for they believed the gods enjoyed stories and ballads. This script is millennia old, and is no longer legible. Long ago, a war waged between the Lord of Storm and the Great Wolf King of the North. Mondstadt was engulfed in blizzards and the snow stung like sand. A group who could bear the cold no longer built a shrine high on a clifftop in the east. There, they prayed for divine mercy and protection. The wind blows for a moment, but the ravages of time are constant, unrelenting, and irreversible. A god of the winds may move between the pages of a book, but in the end, the merciless god of time will eat away at them until not a single legible word remains. Yet, time's assault and that of the wind often take their toll the same upon the heart. Perhaps that is why later generations presumed the shrine to have always been to the wind and the wind alone. Now this story is an interesting culmination. It feels like a logical step towards a conclusion from the other pieces, especially because it gives us something of a chronological order to follow from the start. In the early days, the people of Mondstadt had a tradition of building theaters on top of windy cliffs to please the gods. This is how things were in the past, as presented in the other pieces. Rituals took the form of performances, for they believed the gods enjoyed stories and ballads, this script is millennia old and is no longer legible. Even theater, poems, and music were included in these rituals. And even the Eamon Locker's tradition of wild fighting for no reason other than the assumed pleasure of the gods was eventually lost, or more likely evolved into the bloody gladiatorial slavery imposed on Mondstadt by the Lawrence clan during their rule. These bloody spectacles were still blessed with prayers to Celestia, as if they were an offering. After this, the story mentioned those who first prayed to the gods for deliverance, bringing us back full circle to the Gunhilder clan, and the first group of rebels who started the revolution against Decarabian. Then the script changes a bit, and things get really interesting. In the book Before Sun and Moon, and throughout Enconomia, the god of time, Istaroth, was hailed as being loved by all of humanity, at least as far as the people of Enconomia were concerned. This was during the time period before the Archons even existed, when Tevat was a unified civilization under the primordial one, Thanes, and his four shades, or more precisely, very shortly after that time period ended. The primordial one was forced to wage war against a mysterious interloper known only as the Second Who Came, and the Forty-Year War left great destruction in its wake. When Enconomia sank beneath the waves due to this, Istaroth was the only divinity that did not forsake them. It is unclear whether or not she simply was sealed below along with them, or came to their aid out of her own choice. She seems to have slowly faded from their texts after the coming of Orobashi from the Dark Sea outside of Tevat, and then from the pages of history entirely. So why does this one surviving mention of her outside of Enconomia sound so ill-omened? It's clear that she came before Venti, but is only ever mentioned alongside him in Mondstadt. So is it possible that whatever made her leave Enconomia also changed her? No longer was she the gentle, beloved Kairos who watched over humanity. It seemed that the ancient Mondstadters feared as much as they revered her. A god of the winds may move between the pages of a book, but in the end, the merciless god of time will eat away at them until not a single legible word remains. Yet time's assault, and that of the wind, often take their toll the same upon the heart. Perhaps that is why later generations presumed the shrine to have always been to the wind, and the wind alone. One could even go so far as to call Istaroth Barbados's mother. He was created from a single thread of the thousand winds of time, after all. And the mystery of the huge difference in the way she was perceived by the people she ruled may well remain a mystery forever, or at least for now. Do you think something traumatic happened between Istaroth and the people of Enconomia? Did she leave the underground civilization when they began to forget her in favor of the great serpent god Orobashi and returned to the upper world jaded and hurt? Even Zhongli says that no immortal is immune to erosion. 
Istaroth being one of the oldest beings in Tevat, Erosion may well have led her personality to change by the time she wandered to Mondstadt. The only other mention of her beyond this time period is in the Inazuma Archon Quest, where A says that she thinks it was Istaroth who helped save Inazuma by helping Makoto, allowing Inazuma's sacred sakura tree to be planted. If that is indeed the truth, as A and Yai suspect, then a shade of the Primordial One was still active as recently as 500 years prior to the main story. These weapon stories continue to stitch together the massive tapestry that is Tevat's long history. Hopefully, knowing this lore in its full scope will help make that big picture more clear to you as you continue your own journey through Tevat. This is the Hexen Zirkle, signing off. We hope you'll join us on our next adventure.